Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you once again for your sustaining grace and your love and ask, Lord, in these moments that the words of my mouth, the meditations and thoughts of all of our hearts and minds together would be pleasing and acceptable, Lord, in your sight. Lord, you're our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You know, very smart people can sometimes get it wrong. Sometimes very smart people just cannot picture the future. Sometimes very smart people can't imagine just how much progress can be made uh, by human ingenuity and human learning. Sometimes people have a hard time imagining just how much we can accomplish as humans. Things that people think are impossible become possible. So here's some uh, statements that were made that were perhaps premature from some pretty smart people. The statement, heavier than air flying machines are impossible. That was from Lord Kelvin, who was the head of the British Royal Society, which was the Science Society in Great Britain, 1895. Uh, Lord Kelvin was wrong about that because, uh, well, airplanes have been around for over 100 years now. Here's another uh, statement from Charlie Chaplin, the cinema star. The cinema is little more than a fad. It's canned drama. What audiences really want to see is flesh and blood on the stage. He went on to make a lot of movies and became the founder of a movie studio. Um, here's one that I think is funny. The Americans have need of the telephone, but we do not. We have plenty of messenger boys. That was from the, uh, the head of the British Post Office in 1878. They had no need of this newfangled telephone. They have messenger boys. Here's Lord Kelvin again, a very smart man, head of this science society. X-rays will prove to be a hoax. Well, I think we kind of like X-rays. Here's one from a brilliant man, Thomas Edison, who said, fooling around with alternating current is just a waste of time. Nobody will use it ever. That's as in AC, AC, DC, alternating current. Uh, yeah, he was wrong about that. Uh, here's a statement from Daryl Zunnick, the movie producer. Television won't be able to hold on to any market it captures after the first six months. People will soon get tired of staring at a plywood box every night. Well, <laughs> we're still staring at that box. It's maybe not made out of plywood anymore, but uh, television, I think, is here to stay. And finally, here's a statement from maybe the most brilliant man that we could ever imagine, Albert Einstein. There is not the slightest indication that nuclear energy will ever be obtainable. It would mean that the atom would have to be shattered at will. Well, even Albert Einstein could be wrong. Even Albert Einstein, whose name is like, you know, if you want to talk about a smart person, an Einstein. Even Einstein was wrong about that, about the ability to split the atom and eventually have nuclear power. Even Einstein could not imagine the progress of science. Even Einstein could not imagine. Even Thomas Edison could not imagine the progress of human knowledge. Human knowledge. Human science. That's what the word science simply means learning or knowledge. Human knowledge has done amazing things in technology, and not just things like movies and television and cell phones and airplanes, but vaccines for polio and smallpox, medical advances, human, human education, human knowledge has allowed us to achieve things that even brilliant people from 100 years ago or even brilliant people from 50 years ago couldn't even fathom. Human education and human knowledge is precious. It's a gift of God. But knowledge and education are not synonymous with wisdom. Wisdom is not the same as knowledge. Biblically, wisdom and knowledge are not the same thing. We sometimes kind of use them almost interchangeably, but wisdom is something different. Wisdom is timeless. Wisdom is not something that, well, we now, because we've invented the cell phone, we have a lot more wisdom than people did 100 years ago. No, we have a lot more knowledge and technology, but wisdom is really timeless. And often the Bible talks about 
wisdom. And that's why I read this verse in the book of James, uh, from James 3, where it says, Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. So wisdom. Wisdom is not measured by your score on the SAT. You know, wisdom is not about how many degrees you have. You know, all, now, all those things are great. I mean, I've got a couple of degrees, and I use them all the time. I'm so thankful that I was able to get a, a college education and, and a master's education. I mean, degrees are a wonderful thing, but that's education, that's knowledge, which is separate, at least biblically, from this idea of wisdom. Wisdom is something else. Matter of fact, James goes on to say this in, in verse 17, and we started by reading this, the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Those things are timeless. Those things are not advances in technology. <laughs> Those things are not something that are just been discovered in the last century. These are things that are timeless. Wisdom is a gift of God. And it's, it's a part of what it means to be a person of faith. We've been talking about a life of faith. We've been talking about faith that works. Faith is not just agreement to a set of doctrines. <laughs> faith is how you live your life. Faith is an action verb. Faith is how we live and talk and interact. And, and it's a faith that works. And part of that is wisdom. Wisdom is one of the fruits of a life of faith. And so I want to focus on this one verse there, verse 17, where James mentions eight things that are a part of wisdom, this wisdom that comes from heaven. Eight things that are, that are basically the fruits of wisdom. And so I know there's eight of them, just I'm taking a minute or two on each one. So let's, let's start with the first one, where wisdom, wisdom from heaven is pure. Pure. I'm going to talk about some of these Greek words. The Greek word for pure there is hognos. Hognos. Now, what does that really mean, pure? Now, the Pharisees had this idea of purity that was very external. The Pharisees, to, to stay pure, in other words, to stay kosher, to stay pure for the Pharisees means you don't touch certain things. You don't touch a dead animal. You don't touch a Gentile. You don't touch a, touch a woman during a certain time of the month. You don't touch a house that is a place where a Gentile lives. There's, there's things that you don't touch. Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. The priest walks by the man on the road because he might be dead, and to touch him would make him impure. You know, he wouldn't be impure if he touched a dead body, so he just skirts on by the man laying on the road. So for the Pharisees, purity is about what you touch, what you come in contact with. James is not talking about that kind of purity, because that, that kind of purity would be ritual purity. The, the Pharisees were obsessed with hand washing, not because they understood germs or, or hygiene. It was, it was about, all about ritual, ritual purity. James is talking about a different kind of purity. He's talking about ethical purity, moral purity. In other words, a pure heart, a clean heart, a pure mind, a clean mind, pure speech, words that are words of truth, not deceptive, not twisted, pure language, pure thoughts, pure heart. It's all about internal purity, not what you touch, not what, not what goes into your mouth, what comes out of your mouth. Jesus said something about this when he was talking about the Pharisees, the Pharisees who were so obsessed with what they're going to touch, with this external ceremonial purity. Jesus said this about the Pharisees in Matthew 23, 25, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. They were concerned about external things that they might touch, but they weren't nearly as concerned about the things that come from the heart, that flow out of your life. So purity is a matter of pure, pure motives, pure integrity, pure words, truthful words. So this wisdom from heaven is pure. 
The second word he mentions, wisdom loves peace. Peace. And the Greek word there is irenikos. The Greek word for peace is Irene. A woman who's named Irene, her name means peace. Hebrew is shalom. Greek is Irene. Irenikos. Um, And so this is wisdom loves peace. Now, again, sometimes when we hear the word peace, we might think about two countries you know, signing a peace treaty. But here, peace is more about interpersonal relationships. Being at peace with your neighbor. Peace between people. Wisdom loves peace between people. And, and you know, I, I don't know about you, but it feels like, at least when I watch the news, there's just so many angry people right now. I mean, part of it is, is just because of everything that's been happening. Part of it's because of the pandemic. Uh, part of it is a cries for social justice. Part, all, all kinds of, but people are just mad. It seems like so many people are just looking to pick fights. People are just living on edge, waiting to pick a fight with somebody else. You know, whether it's about masks or vaccines or, or politics or, you know, the, the past election or whatever. People are just looking for an argument. And the most, I mean, I've never seen on the news so many school board meetings devolve into shouting matches and people screaming at each other. I mean, they look like the WWE steel cage matches at these school board meetings, um, you know, where they're about ready to, to pound on each other. You know, they showed one on the news last night. There were people following the school board member to his car and screaming at him, I know where you live. We're going to get you. This is a school board meeting. People are just angry. And there's some people who just seem like they're spoiling for a fight. Wisdom is always looking for peace. Wisdom is always looking for peace. Proverbs 20 verse 3 says this, Avoiding a fight is a mark of honor. Only fools insist on quarreling. Avoiding a fight is a mark of honor. Only fools insist on quarreling. Now, sometimes we do have to stand up and fight for something. Sometimes we have to defend the defenseless. Sometimes we do have to fight for a righteous cause. This is not saying you never stand up and fight. Sometimes... You know, Paul talks about fighting the good fight. Paul was a scrappy, and Paul often was a fighter in many ways. So uh, this is not saying never fight, but it's saying, you know, we always look for peace first. Fighting needs to be the last resort. You know, we are called to be peacemakers. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Um, So... Even though we may have to fight, we're not just salivating at the prospect of fighting. We do everything we can not to fight. We're, we're peacemakers. We love peace. Now, the next word in that passage from James is wisdom loves being considerate. The word here in Greek is really hard to translate. Epiekes. Epiekes. And the NIV translates it as considerate. Um, Another translation translates it as courteous. Another translation translates it as gentle. So you think about those three words, gentle, courteous, considerate. They all kind of mean the same thing, but they're not quite, they don't have quite the same connotation, which is just something I think sometimes we just, we Americans and in the English-speaking world, you know, need to remember. Anytime we're reading our Bible um, in English, we're reading a translation. You know, I mean, I think there's people who think, you know, Moses was reading the King James translation of the Bible. Um, you know, I think, I, I mean, I really do think, I think there are people who, who, unfortunately, some fundamentalists don't understand that the King James Bible is a translation of, of Hebrew and Greek that's 400 years old. Um, every time we read the Bible, we're reading an English translation. Unless you are fluent in Hebrew and Greek, and I studied both, but I'm by no means fluent. I read my Bible in English. Uh, unless you're fluent in Hebrew and Greek, you're always going to be reading a translation. And that means some words, you know, I've heard people make, you know, big arguments based on an English word in the Bible 
And if they really studied the Greek or the Hebrew word, they would not be quite so sure about what they're saying. So this word is one of those hard words to translate. Um, what does it really mean, epiekes? Well, Aristotle said that this word means justice and beyond justice. So it's, it's willingness to go beyond the letter of the law. Willingness to go beyond the letter of the law to the spirit of the law. Maybe a modern, I've used this phrase before, it's really saying I'm willing to give somebody a break. You know, instead of holding somebody to the letter of the law, I'm willing to give somebody a break. I'm willing not to demand my rights, but to give somebody else some grace, even if maybe the letter of the law says they don't deserve grace. Here's the line. It's willing to say, in the spirit of the law, I'm going to give you a break. I'm going to show you consideration. I'm going to, I'm going to be courteous, even if I don't have to be courteous. Um, I'm going to show you love and respect, even when maybe you don't deserve it. Um, if you were watching the Olympics last week, you may have seen on the news about a a moment that showed the Olympic spirit. There weren't any medals. There weren't anybody crossing the finish line. I was there during the 800 meter men's, uh, one of the semifinal heats. And two people had a collision an American, Isaiah Jewett, and a man from Botswana, Nigel Amos. And as they're running along, there's a collision. And you may have seen this on the news. And they're running along, and there's a collision. <laughs> And, you know, Olympic dreams, Olympic hopes are dashed. I mean, it's a moment of, it's a tragic moment, you know. I'll, it's a tragic moment. And these two guys stand up, and you can, you can imagine a fist fight breaking out, but instead, you see that. <laughs> instead of them blaming each other, instead of them pointing fingers at each other, instead of them, you know, they put their arms around each other and walk to the finish line. Um, because that's what we like to see in athletic competition, is even though, you know, this is a dream of years of hard work, but things happen. And in that moment, instead of, you know, accusations and anger, there's, in the midst of the disappointment, there's, there's grace, there's courtesy, there's consideration. Here's what the American said about that moment. He said, I learned from all the superhero animations I watch. Okay, good job. Right off the bat, he, I'm, he's doing well there. Okay. I learned from all the superhero animations I watch, regardless of how mad you are, you have to be a hero at the end of the day. That was my version of trying to be a hero. He goes on to say, standing up and showing good character, even if it's my rival or whoever I'm racing, I don't want any bad because that's what heroes do. They show their humanity through who they are. They show that they're good people. You know, that's being considerate. That is epiekes. Another word that James uses is submission. Wisdom loves submission. Eupithis. Eupithis is the Greek there. And again, the word submission is kind of, again, not the word that I wish we could use because when you hear the word submission, it sounds like a very weak word. I'm going to submit. You know, it feels like somebody who's kind of walking around with their head down. I have to submit to something. It sounds like very, you know, you're, you're you know, it sounds like the guy, you know, in the wrestling match. And one of the guys finally has to tap out. You know, I submit, I give up. So the, the word submission is kind of not the best word there. Um, the New Living Translation translates it, instead of submission, translates it as willing to yield. Willing to yield. It really, again, the Greek conveys the idea of not being stubborn. Basically, not only being willing to yield, being willing to listen. Being, will, being willing to listen to another point of view. Being open to even changing your mind if the facts 
warrant it. Being open to another point of view, being, being open, not being stubborn. You know, the, again, I think in the last, this, for everything from the, the uh, presidential election and the pandemic and all the things that have been in the news and, and people are just mad about, it, it, what's one of the most disappointing things is that some people are dug in and I don't care what anybody says, I'm not going to change my mind. You know, I don't care what you tell me. I don't care what facts you have. I don't care what arguments you make. I don't care. I, I'm, I'm, I'm closed off to any opinion other than my opinion. I'm closed off to anything other than what I've chosen to believe. I mean, and there's, you know, there's honest disagreement about all kinds of things. There's honest disagreement about politics and policy. There's honest disagreement about you know, some of the best ways to deal with the pandemic. And I mean, there's people who have thought about it and have rational, studied arguments that we may disagree with, but there, there's rational people out there making arguments and, w and are willing to listen to other people who have a different viewpoint. And there's some people who are also just, I mean, who have sold out to, to just craziness. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I saw just this week, somebody uh, had put online that... Um, Bill Gates has put microchips in the vaccine to keep you from buying Apple products. So that you will only buy Microsoft products, that the chip inside the vaccine will force you to buy Microsoft instead of Apple. I mean, <laughs> I just, you know, there, there, are, there, are some, there are some stuff out there that is just kind of out there like Elvis is in the spaceship stuff. I mean, it's just really far out. Um, but this quality is saying, you know, I'm willing to talk to somebody who disagrees with me. I'm willing to listen to somebody else's viewpoint. I I'm, I'm open to having a friendly conversation and, and not making a person my enemy because they disagree with me. Uh, it, it's this idea, submission doesn't mean I'm, I'm weak or I, I give in. It means I'm open to talking to other people. And, and I think if we could have more of that, we'd be in a lot better shape than we are. The next word, or the next two words, it says, Wisdom is full of mercy and good fruit. Mercy and good fruit. And the Greek word for mercy is elos. Elos. And mercy here, um, well, mercy is, is sometimes hard. It's hard to show mercy to some people. And this word, really, the connotation of this kind of mercy is mercy for people even if they don't deserve it. Mercy for people even if they don't really deserve it. Even mercy for people who are in trouble because they've dug their own hole. <laughs> mercy for people who are in trouble because of their own foolishness. That we still show mercy to people even though they've gotten themselves into a mess. Um, you know, think about this. Think about the young, young mother, let's say. And the young mother says to her five-year-old, don't touch that hot stove. Don't touch that hot stove because it will burn your hand. You'll burn yourself if you touch that hot stove. Don't touch it. Do not put your hand on that stove. And mom says that with firmness and, and clarity. And sure enough, when she turns her back, the five-year-old puts her hand on the stove and burns her hand. Now, what does mom do at that point? Mom say, well, I told you not to. Don't cry to me. Go away. Get out of my sight. It's your fault. You should have listened to me. Get out of here. Does mom say that? Does mom say, you got yourself into this mess. Get yourself out of it, five-year-old. No, I would hope not. I would hope mom wouldn't say that. Mom is going to take the child and depending upon the severity of the burn, run, hot, run cold water on it, put ointment on it, or if it's third, I mean, take them to the ER or whatever because you might say, well, it's their own fault. You know, why does she show mercy to that child? That child disobeyed her. That child got themselves into that problem. Why does she show that child any mercy? because she loves her child. 
even though the child got in trouble through disobedience and foolishness. This word is saying that we show that kind of mercy not only to our own children, that we show it to other, to one another. And that's, I'll be honest, that's hard. It's hard to show mercy to people who've gotten in trouble through their own foolishness. It's hard to have compassion for people who've gotten in trouble through their own foolishness. That's where we as Christians go above and beyond what is expected in the world. But think about the example Jesus set on this. When Jesus has been condemned for being an insurrectionist, lashed with a whip, put thorns in his forehead, marched through the streets of Jerusalem and taken to Golgotha where they begin to proceed with an execution, where they begin to put, put metal spikes into his wrists. As the soldier is driving the spike into his wrist, Jesus says, God will get you for this. Nope, that's not what he says. Jesus says, I'll have my revenge on you someday. Nope, he doesn't say that either. Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He prays for the people who are killing him. He shows mercy towards the people as he says they are they don't know what they're doing. They're, they're being foolish. They're, they're, they're misguided. They, they don't know what they're doing. But he still has mercy. Now that's hard. It's hard. It's hard in this climate to do that. But wisdom is full of mercy and good fruit. We know about the fruit part. We know what Jesus says about fruit. We know Jesus says, if you're connected to me, he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And he says, if you are connected to me, then you'll bear good fruit. He says, apart from me, you cannot bear good fruit. Apart from the vine, the branches cannot bear good fruit. You know, and we know what the fruit of the Spirit is. You know, peace, love. You know, we know all those words that we talk about the fruit of the Spirit. So when we're connected to Jesus, we can bear good fruit. A few more words. Impartiality. Wisdom loves impartiality. Adiakritios. Adiakritos. And it means here someone who shows no favoritism, someone who shows no prejudice. Okay? Impartiality, no, no prejudice, no favoritism. Um, now here the, the English word is kind of interesting, the English word, the word prejudice. If we, if we are impartial, we don't have prejudice. And think about just the word that makes up the word prejudice, prejudge. Prejudice is to prejudge. You know, I don't like that person because they are black, white, Hispanic, Asian. I don't like that person because they're a Republican, a Democrat. I don't like that person because they come from wherever, Alabama. I, I mean, you know, <laughs> I don't, I mean, <laughs> I mean, what, whatever. You, you, have, you, you have a picture in your head, people who are in this political party are like this. People who are, have this skin color are like this. People who come from this part of the country are like this. People who, you know, people, men are like this. Women are like this. Whatever. You, you prejudge based on some characteristic. You prejudge a person based on something, some incidental quality of them. That is prejudice. I mean, you know, we know the history of prejudice is about skin color or accent or all kinds of ridiculous things that people are prejudiced about. We, we prejudge people when we find out something about them before we even ever meet them. You know, when I, when, I moved to, when I moved to California to go to grad school, go to seminary, the first, pers the first person I met was the apartment manager of the apartment I moved into, <clears throat> and he was, he was my age because managing these less than wonderful apartments. <laughs> um, they, were not, they were not the best part of town. Managing these less than wonderful apartments was his part-time job, and he was starting seminary just like me. He was a year older than I was, but he, he was 
just like me, starting seminary. And he's the first person I met when I pulled up to the apartment complex and had to find my apartment. So he was the first friend I made in California. And, you know, I found out, okay, he's from Northern California. And, you know, Northern California, like, that's, that's even weirder than Southern California, Northern California. And he, uh, his hair was a little longer than mine. He smoked a pipe. I thought that was weird. I found out, I found out he was a Notre Dame fan. And I'm like, oh, Notre Dame, I mean, we Sooners have a long memory. Notre Dame broke OU's winning streak in the 50s, and before I was born. But, uh, I mean... All these things, you know, but his name was Kevin, and, you know, he became my closest, you know, seminary friend. Um, even, even though he came from Northern California, even though he was a Notre Dame fan. I mean, he became such a friend that when Jeannie and I got married, he was one of my groomsmen. That's, that's Kevin on the far right there. That's, that's me in the middle. I know you, <laughs> I don't look like that anymore, but... Uh, uh, but, you know, we prejudge people with all kinds of reasons, all kinds of things. But wisdom does not prejudge. Wisdom does not show partiality. And the last word here in this list of wisdom words is sincerity. Sincere. Wisdom is sincere. Greek word there is anupokritos. And it means literally in Greek, without hypocrisy. Without hypocrisy. Hypocritos is the Greek word for hypocrite, which means literally a hypocrite in Greek is one who wears a mask. One who wears a mask. That's what the word hypocrite means. It comes from the Greek theater where they would literally wear, not, you know, not like wearing masks now in, with, you know, for germs. We're talking about a mask for the theater. Like I'm coming out as a different character now and I have a mask in front of my face. And so in the theater, the Greek theater, they would wear masks to portray different characters. And that word, one who wears a mask, came to mean a phony. Somebody who, you know, I, I act this way when I'm with this person, but I put on a different mask when I'm with this person. You know, depending on the situation, I act one way over here, and I put on a different face when I'm over here. I'm a, I'm a hypocrite. I'm a person who wears a mask. But wisdom doesn't wear a mask. In fact, the, uh, the word there says one who is without a mask, one who is not a hypocrite. We as Christians are sincere. Now all this sums up to what he says at the end. He says, the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure and peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. We sow in peace, we reap righteousness. This is the wisdom that James reminds us, and, and this is wisdom that, you know, it, it doesn't matter your level of education. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, um, you know, what century you're born in. This is wisdom that is eternal. This is wisdom that is a part of what it means uh, to be a person of faith and to be a person who's a follower of Christ. It's the wisdom that we pray for because it's the wisdom that comes from heaven. Let's pray together. Lord, once again, we're thankful for your sustaining grace. I ask that you'd bless us now. Watch over us in your name. Amen.